Let us now see some implications of this rank nullity in the context of one to one and on two maps, right? So I think it's by now, okay, let me leave it there for the moment. And now let us say that you have, suppose phi is one to one. What is the equivalent condition of one to one that we saw just a while back? The kernel of phi must be the zero subspace. What is the dimension of the kernel in that case? Zero, right? So that means by the rank nullity theorem, what must we say? What should we be able to infer? That dimension of V from where you are taking objects and passing it through phi must then necessarily be equal to dimension of the image of phi. Is it not? Right? Just straightforward application of the rank nullity theorem to this condition. Okay? Suppose phi is onto surjective. What do we know? What do we know about the image of phi in that case? It's W, right? So then dimension of V is equal to dimension of kernel of phi plus dimension of W. But now, what sort of values can this number take? Non-negative integers, is it not? So what can you say for onto maps about the relations between the dimensions of V and those of Ws? See dimension of V minus dimension of W is equal to dimension of kernel phi which is what greater than or equal to 0. So therefore dimension of V in such case can you not say this the dimension of V what is it? Yeah, greater than or equal to you have to you cannot discount the possibility that it's also equal. What about this? Can we say anything about it? Of course we can. Where is this image of phi residing inside? See image of phi is residing inside W. So it is a subspace of W. Can the dimension of a subspace be greater than the space inside which it resides? Of course not. So this is less than or equal to dimension of W. Right? Straight away. Yeah. In view of this, now I urge you to think in terms of matrices back again. So we'll keep going back and forth with phi and matrices as special cases of these kind of phi's or linear transformations. Now think about it. What do you think, where do you think do fat matrices and tall matrices fit into the picture? So can tall matrices be both one to one and on two? If at best they can be one of them, then which of these can they be? What does a tall matrix do? Suppose you have a matrix A which is M cross N. Can I not think of this as a mapping from mapping from where to where? Right. Yeah? So what kind of matrices do you think can be one to one? Sorry? Tall. tall. Tall means these numbers, if you will think of them, M is greater than N. So that means fits in here, right? Because M is where you are mapping to, N is where you are picking out objects to map from, right? Similarly, if it's onto, 
then it must be a wide or a fat matrix, right. Now the only way that you can fit both of these pictures at the same time, not just for matrices but for mappings in general, if I want a bijection, what am I basically talking about? Now you have to impose both of these restrictions and therefore for a bijection, what do I require? That the dimension of V must equal the dimension of W. In other words, in the language of matrices, I am talking about square matrices. Yeah? Straight away, right? If you have to invoke both of these, then equality is the only possibility. So if equality holds, is it guaranteed? I mean, is it an if and only if condition? Not really, right? This is a necessary condition for bijection. But just because you have this, I can cook up several uh, linear maps, which are mapping from vector spaces of equal dimension, doesn't mean that the map is always going to turn out to be, or the linear map is always going to turn out to be a bijection, of course not. In fact, if you do manage to find a bijection between two vector spaces, independent of your knowledge about their dimensions, if you found that they are indeed bijections, that's an independent way of proving that the dimensions of the two vector spaces must be equal. You follow what the point is, right? Just because I've told you that the dimensions of the vector spaces are equal, not every mapping that takes fellows from V to fellows in W is a bijection. Just because the dimension is equal, it doesn't guarantee that. But if you found a bijection from a vector space V to a vector space W, then you can definitely be sure that V and W have the same dimensions. In fact, this is a very important class of mappings and we say that these are isomorphisms. So morph means morphology means structure, iso means similar, right? So if you find a linear bijection, yeah, then that is the same as finding an isomorphism. You've already seen one isomorphism, though I didn't probably give it that name at that point in time. Can you think of what I have described in this class, which is an isomorphism? The way we assigned coordinates. Yeah, the way we assigned coordinates is a clear cut case of an isomorphism. Why? Well, here's another interesting cute little result that will tell us show us in a very easy manner why it must be true, why what we have shown is an isomorphism. So the claim is this, okay, suppose dimension of V is equal to dimension of W. So I've already started with this, that dimension of V is equal to dimension of W does not mean it's a bijection. But under these given circumstances, surjection implies injection and the other way around. In other words, when you know a priori that the dimensions of the two vector spaces V and W are the same. If you manage to show that a particular mapping is an injection or a one to one mapping, you don't need to separately prove that it's onto. And the same way if you know somehow, if it's easy to show that it's an, it's an onto mapping, you don't need to separately prove that it's an injection, it automatically follows, right? So just verifying one property brings the other property as a guarantee, right? So how do we show this? Suppose, of course, this is a base that we have to build it on. So this is going to be true anyway. Assume injection.
It's just what we have done a while back. Just for the sake of this proof, I'll have to rewrite this. Assume injection means what? The equivalence condition is that the kernel of phi is 0, right? So dimension V is equal to dimension kernel phi plus dimension image phi. But this, of course, is 0. Yeah? What do I know about dimension v? Dimension v is equal to dimension w. So this means, this means what? Dimension w, from this given condition I am invoking here, and from this given condition that it is an injection I am invoking here, is equal to dimension of image of phi. But look, the image of phi is contained in w, if its dimension is equal to w, we have been over this step in the previous lecture too. We have seen that if a subspace has the same dimension as the original vector space, then they must be one and the same. You do not have to show containment both ways likewise to show that they are one and the same. So this means that w is equal to image of phi, which is surjection, right? Next. If you assume surjection first, again it is the rank nullity to the rescue all the way. So if you assume surjection first, then what happens? Of course, just write the base step again that rank nullity which is why I have not erased it. Dimension V is equal to dimension kernel phi plus dimension. What is this image phi? W, right? W. But again, by the by the given condition, this and this must vanish. So therefore, dimension kernel phi must be equal to zero. But we know of only one vector space which has dimension zero, which is the zero subspace, right? So kernel of phi must be. That is, phi is an injection. So when you are dealing with vector spaces whose dimensions are the same, verifying one property is tantamount to verifying both of them at the same time. You do not have to separately verify them, right? So why is this useful? What were we discussing just before this? Yeah? Isomorphism. Isomorphisms, right? So now think about isomorphisms and think about the case where we assign this coordinates and we claimed, I just claimed a while back that it is an isomorphism. What is the one claim that I had made then? Think about that matrix, that dictionary that I called from one language to the other. What is in the kernel of that matrix? We have already claimed that that matrix is non-singular. It is invertible. Why? Because we saw that the 0 gets mapped to the 0. The 0 of vector space V, the n-dimensional vector space gets mapped to the 0 of the n-tuple f to the n and nothing else. So then it means what? Dimension of V is n, dimension of f to the n is n. So they are definitely vector spaces of same dimension. That is what the uh, coordinate assignment does. So this checks out that V is equal to W and I have already shown injection because I have shown you that the kernel contains nothing other than 0. So that means it is a surjection. If it is both injection and surjection, it is a bijection. If it is a bijection, then see nothing is like carved in stone. It is all basically part of the definitions and just pushing your way through. So it means it is an isomorphism. They are the same structure which means that you can basically deal with them like you deal with Euclidean spaces. That is why the idea of matrices is so powerful because once you have a finite dimensional vector space, once you can figure out what its dimension is, you can always say there is an isomorphism through coordinate assignment, through choice of an ordered basis, there is this isomorphism and then you can deal with it like you deal with n tuples of numbers. 
right? So that is the power of this isomorphism, right? So it's very important that you find out in any way whatsoever some one to one onto linear map. So the three things that you need in a map, it's got to be linear, it's got to be one to one, it's got to be onto. If you can guarantee those three things, you don't have to check the dimensions of those spaces separately. You can rest assured that the dimensions of the two spaces will be equal. Yeah. There's another beautiful thing that this allows us to do, which is when there is an isomorphism, you can always cook up inverses. Yeah. You can always get inverse maps. And the fact is that even this inverse map is going to be linear. Right? So not only does it guarantee the existence of the inverse, but it also says that the inverse map is also going to be linear. That is the question that we shall now try and investigate. For matrices, you already know this to be true. You have this formula. We, we, we are not going into those formula based things like determinants and all. But you know that A is a matrix, so A inverse is also a matrix. So of course, any matrix is a linear transformation. So if you are operating between uh, vector spaces or n tuples of numbers where n is equal on either side, then it's a square matrix and any square matrix, you know the explicit formula for those invertible square matrices, right? But what we shall see is that in general for any linear transformation, this is true, right? So that is, that is the main value or, of this kind of thing. And then we shall see something very interesting, even when you don't have square matrices, that is to say, even when you don't have the dimensions of these two sides to be equal, you can still have some limited kind of inverses, yeah, in a limited sense. You cannot have inverses like you do for square matrices, but you can still push your luck and get certain kinds of, certain special kinds of inverses, right? So that is going to be the object of our investigations next. Any questions or doubts so far? All right. Before we move over to these studies of these inverses, there's a very important property that will set the tone for our study, which is that what is it that is so good and nice about linear transformations? Why do we prefer them? Or why do we feel that they're tractable? See, when you're dealing with finite dimensional vector spaces, if you want to characterize what a linear transformation does to each and every object in that vector space, and that can be an infinite number of objects in the vector space, you only need to know what it does to a finite number of objects in the vector space, and that's it. You don't care about anything, any other piece of information, right? So, so if phi, which is a linear mapping from vector space V to vector space W, so these are finite dimensional vector spaces, Right? Okay. So phi can be completely characterized by its action on any basis or V, right? Which is to say that, suppose BV is equal to V1, V2, till VN is, so suppose this is a basis for V, then knowledge of phi v1 till phi vn suffices in evaluating phi v for any v in This is going to be the theme for any linear system, okay? 
that you know what it does to a few of them and you can basically extend that and figure out what it does to every one of them. So this is why it's so important to understand what a linear transformation does to a basis set. All right. So let's try and understand why this is true. Any V in V can be written as V is equal to summation alpha i V i i going from 1 through n. Consider phi v which is nothing but phi acting on the same object summation alpha i v i. But now because of the linearity I can pull out these terms one by one separate them. So this is nothing but summation alpha i phi v i. I have done two operations at one go. Okay. I first said this is phi of alpha 1 v 1 plus alpha 2 v 2 plus dot 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 till alpha n v n which is equal to phi of alpha v 1 plus phi of alpha v 2 plus phi of alpha v 3 and then I have subsequently pulled out the alphas outside the scalars and said it is alpha 1 phi v 1 plus alpha 2 phi v 2 plus alpha 3 phi v 3 so on till alpha n phi v n. Right? So I have done both of those at, the, at one go. But then notice what are these objects? These are exactly the action of phi on the basis. So irrespective of whatever v you pick out, I didn't choose this v to be anything special, it's an arbitrary fellow, just an ordinary fellow sitting inside v, which is representable in terms of this basis. So all that you need to understand in order to understand the action of or characterize an action of, of this phi is to understand what it does to a basis set. Once you know what it does to a basis set, you basically defined it for good, right? Yeah. So, it is then important in this light to investigate how we can say that when there is a 1 to 1 onto or a bijection mapping between two vector spaces V and W, the inverse will also turn out to be linear. And then how do we define the inverse? Of course, defining the inverse that recipe is going to be very straightforward once we have figured that the inverse is also linear. Because just like the original map, the inverse map is also going to lend itself to easy description once we know what it does to particular fellows therein. Right? Okay. So this, this idea is clear. Suppose phi, which is a mapping from V to W is an isomorphism. First we have to understand what we mean by this idea of an inverse. So I will try and explain that by means of a diagram. So this is V, this is W and this is V again. So suppose I go this way using phi, right? Then I go this way using psi. If all that it does is basically maps V to itself in what we call the identity mapping, this is the ID, ID means identity, identity mapping but identity mapping in vector space V, right? What do you think is the cumulative effect of these two? Yeah? No, but if I want to compose these operations together, isn't this 
the same as psi composed with phi being the same as the identity in the vector space V, right. On the other hand, if I had the following W, V and W, right. So, sorry, different chalk. So, this is my phi, right. So, this phi takes me from V to W and this is basically the equivalent of, okay, have I used the same color? No, I should use the blue color probably, right? Yeah. So there's a fellow W here, which gets mapped to W. Note that this is the identity in the, the identity mapping in W. It takes objects in W and maps it to the same object back. Yeah, but then I am seeking, maybe I should have used a different color for the object that I am seeking, which is in this case psi and in this case this psi. So this is the much sought after entity, but their actions are different you see, because in this case, in this case, what is the object doing? Just notice what is happening, first psi acts on it followed by the action of phi. So is not this the same as phi composed with psi giving me the identity operation in W. Is that clear? See it is very important to understand. If I do not put this subscript here you might be led to believing oh it is the identity, no it is not. So that is the significance of the left operation and the right operation. In either case, the object I am seeking is psi, all right. So that is the idea of inverse, one sided inverses may exist, but both sided inverse will exist for isomorphisms, yeah. That is, that is the claim. So with this picture, we would like to bring this module to a close and we will discuss the idea of inverses and how they can be uh, defined. Given a map, how we can actually go about constructively defining the inverse of that linear map, okay.